Hello everyone, welcome to the Force Plate Coach YouTube channel. My name's John McMahon and in this video I'm going to talk about basic Force Plate setup. Now this video potentially contains some boring information but it's certainly important information so please bear with me during this early part of the video. Um, to begin, I just want to make sure that you know that this is going to be mainly applicable to portable Force Plates. If you don't know what a portable Force Plate looks like then thanks to Hawking Dynamics whose Twitter and Instagram handle you can see on the screen there for letting me use their picture of their force plates in this particular video. So as the name implies with portable force plates you can take them around to different training and testing locations. You may even know with your portable plates only bring them out when you come to use the force plates and so you may place them just in different locations within the same testing or training facility. So a lot of the points that I'm going to raise in this video will be relevant only to portable based systems but there will be some points that will also be relevant to any in-ground force plate systems that you also might use and I'll make sure I point that out throughout the video. So to begin with, the first boring point that I alluded to earlier is just to make sure that you read the manufacturer's user guides. Now I know that might make for some nice bedtime reading, particularly if you struggle to sleep, uh, but it's really important if you get any force tech that you really take the time to immerse yourself within the literature that's provided when you buy that system, or even any videos and, and uh, different blogs and things that those different manufacturers might have available on their websites. Now I know that's a fairly obvious thing to point out, but there is a tendency for people to want to rush when you get new sports tech. If you're anything like me, you get a little bit giddy at the fact that you've got something new to play with and you want to try and just, I suppose, by a trial and error, work out how to use that system. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with that, I suppose, but if you're going straight into testing athletes, because we want to make sure that we're not wasting their time um, and our own time as well, of course, we need to really make sure that we do the prep before we start testing any of our athletes. And using uh, the reader, sorry, reading the user guide is certainly going to be part of that process. The other fairly obvious thing, but again, sometimes this can trip people up, is making sure that you connect the plates and the software as specified by the different manufacturers. Now, some of the different force plate systems out there might require a Wi-Fi signal, some might require Bluetooth, um, some of them might need wires that are having to be placed into multiple systems to make it work. So for example, between the force plates and a laptop, and you need to tape all those different things down. Um, force plates and the software that accompanies it comes in all different types of varieties. And so just again, make sure you understand how to set up that system. And as an example, if you're going to go and test a different training facility, and Wi-Fi is one of the things that you need to have enabled when you come to use your force plates, then obviously make sure that you can either access that facility's Wi-Fi or you You've got enough data, I suppose, on your mobile phone, for example, to make sure that you can hotspot. At the end of the day, what you'd want to do is miss out on any opportunities when it comes to testing your athletes. Um, so, especially if you're doing this for research purposes or even as part of your own in house work at whatever club you're currently affiliated with, on say, for example, using force plates to monitor neuromuscular fatigue, the timing that you test the athletes is super important. So, it might be, for example, match day minus one immediately before the match immediately following the match and then at various time epochs after and so what you don't want to do is have anything that is in the way of the setup that ends up meaning that you can't end up collecting that data when the timings are meant to be quite rigid for you to answer your research question and um, so that's the second boring thing now I've, again another really important point is to make sure that the force plates are set on a flat and stable surface now you wouldn't believe the amount of training venues that I've been to before where we struggle to find any flat surface at all. Um, obviously you hopefully won't find yourself in that situation but if you move the force plates around eventually you will, will find something uh, that resembles a flat piece of floor. And we need to make sure the floor is flat because we can't have any wobble occurring in either of those two force plates like you can see on the screen in a Hawking Dynamics example or even if it's just a single force plate the same applies there. So you want to rock each of the corners and to make sure they don't rock in fact you want to kind of stand on those and make sure they're nice and stable before you start to test. As part of that process then um, you need to try and make sure that the test surface is consistent where appropriate and I say where appropriate because like I said all, all the way back at the beginning you may be taking your force plates out to different training and testing venues and so you can't guarantee that that surface is going to be consistent but we know through the research that different surfaces are going to affect the noise that's associated with the force plate signal um, and also might end up absorbing some of the forces that the athletes applying when they land from a jump for example. Um, so I would say ideally you would make sure the training or testing surface rather is consistent in so much as if you're testing on a concrete surface and you're feeding into the, a database that's hopefully going to be uh, following a continuous setup plan that you make sure your con concrete surface is consistent every time. Obviously the exact surface might differ but if it's along the right kind of surface, then you'll be fine. 
Um, I put that down as a question mark there, or not a question mark, you've got kind of the thinking man, I suppose, is the icon in that bullet point. And that's because I do appreciate that, you know, depending on where you are testing, you might switch between, say, a wooden surface or a gym rubber matted surface and a concrete surface. I would say if you are in a situation like that, and that has to be part of the way you collect the data, then if you can, try and quantify how much of, of a difference those different surfaces make through doing a little mini research project or at least account for the standard error of measurement within each of the different testing surfaces and take that into account when it comes to interpreting any data that you take away from that force plate testing. Um, the other thing that's a, an optional consideration is to place some tape just by each of the four plate, force plate's feet and so that might look something like this. The reason I say this is, is because if you have bothered to look around for that perfect bit of flat floor to test your athletes, sometimes when athletes land from a jump, for example, they'll shunt the force plate forwards. And in my experience, there's been a few occasions where when that force plate's been shunted forwards, it might no longer be on that flat surface. And one of those four corners of the force plate now be, might be on a wobbling surface. So if you get a little bit of sticky tape, stick that down on your surface, if you're allowed. Obviously, you get the permission of the testing venue first. You'll see, like you've seen in the picture there, that the force plate then, if those feet kind of go beyond the tape, you've got a fairly obvious kind of visual cue that those force plates have shifted. And so you might just want to then slide them back in between testing athletes to make sure that that force plate system's in the same place. If you're not fortunate enough to use a wireless based system, like you can see in the Hawking Dynamics example, and you've got cables that are connected into the force plate, then that's where that shunting forward of the force plate when athletes land can be even more problematic. Because again, I've experienced examples where that shunting has been so fast, so you know, talking about 10 centimeters or so that the force plate shunted forward when an athlete's landed, that it can actually disconnect the cable from the force plate. And that might require you to go all the way back to the start in terms of your setup, making sure that you have to calibrate your system in some circumstances. So a little trick like just putting the tape down can be something that can save you a lot of time in terms of read collecting data afterwards. Um, and then the last thing I just want to mention is the importance of zeroing the force plates. So by zeroing the force plates, what I mean is there'll either be a zero button that's in the software that you're using. So that could be on the laptop or on the, uh, the iPad or Android tablet, or it could be on the actual force plates themselves. You click on that and it will take away the previous force that was registered on that system um, and it will also help to reduce any accumulation of signal noise in that force signal when the force plates are just unloaded. That happens just by the number of impacts that they experience. So for example, if we were to keep those force plates just running and we do a load of jumps on there and then I go away, somebody else comes in and does another series of jumps, obviously every time we land there's an impact and a vibration that's going through that system. That's going to shift the force plates around a little bit. Even the marker tape trick that you've maybe used isn't going to pick that up all the time. And every time that those force plates are loaded, it's going to amplify that baseline, we call it signal noise. And that's where the force plates are kind of oscillating, not at a pure zero when they're unloaded. They'll kind of be slightly plus or minus by a couple of newtons. But that can certainly end up drifting and, and becoming larger if we don't zero the force plate in between each trial. So that's really important. So we know that every time we get an athlete to stand on the force plate, or commence in a squat position if it's a squat jump, or in a semi-squat position if it's an ISO pull or squat, that that force plate has got no previous record on there, and we're trying to make sure that that data is as less noisy as possible. Okay, now I said at the start, this is boring but important stuff, um, so I just want to specify and apologize for that again at the end, um, but hopefully if you've not used force plates much in the past, you've at least now considered some of the things that you should be hopefully taking into account when you set up your force plate systems. So thank you for watching this video. Um, I've got my Twitter and Instagram handle on there, at forceplatecoach. Please feel free to reach out and ask me any questions. I assure you that the videos are gonna become more interesting, particularly for those of you that are watching that have already got quite an advanced understanding of the force plates and you may be more interested in variable selection and how you might maybe be able to monitor athletes and rank them and, and track those performances over the time. Um, so please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done already and you'll be the first ones to find out when I post some of those more exciting videos in the future. Thank you.